Okay, uh, welcome everyone. I think it's time to start our next session on the theme of science communication and research impact. So um, my name is Steffen Lemke from ZPW in Kiel in Germany. And um, also on behalf of my co-organizers, Isabella Peters, Said Ul Hassan and Timothy Bowman, I welcome you warmly to the session on science communication and research impact. And yeah, uh, all of us organizers have in the past years worked on problems and questions related to the theme. Uh, you might also have noticed um, the logo on the first slide and also on the bottom of this slide um, of the project Medico, which is a project that Isabella and I are working in that deals with very similar questions as the ones that we will um, hear about today during our talks. So in case you're interested in this theme and uh, today's presentations, you might also be interested maybe to check out later what we did in Medico. Yeah, um, but first uh, let me start by um, giving you a rough overview over what we've planned for this upcoming hour. So um, after the administrative things are um, explained, I will also continue with a short um, introduction on the theme and on some concepts and terms that we also um, thought about um, when proposing the session to SDI. And um, that will maybe take about eight to 10 minutes. And afterwards, we are then delighted to have two invited speakers today. Uh, first will be Professor Markus Lehmkuhl, who will um, report on aspects related to medialization of science. And um, he will then be followed by Professor Enrico Odunia Malea, who will report on recent work um, on scientometric inspired approaches in the study of press releases. Now, for each presentation, we've uh, planned for about 15 minutes of presentation time and then about five minutes for questions and answers and discussion. So um, please make use of the question button whenever you have any questions to our two speakers. Um, I'm sure by now, uh, probably all of you will be familiar with this platform and uh, will know of the question button, which should be below these slides in this video for you to submit questions. And um, yeah, our planning should also leave us with a few um, minutes of buffer time in the end. So in the case uh, that we can't address all questions directly uh, after um, the presentations, we might also still have some time in the end of the session to address questions that uh, were left over. Okay, um, but on to uh, our short introduction of today's theme of the session. Um, because I think that uh, if you just take our session's title, uh, Science Communication and Research Impact, um, yeah, that might sound a bit unspecific, especially compared to some of the other session's titles. So I think it might be worthwhile to um, have a short look at some of the key terms at the center of what the session is uh, uh, about. And um, especially also on some terms that might maybe at the first glance seem fairly interchangeable, but are not. And um, the first of such terms, of course, is scholarly communication. And just to remind all of us, um, when we talk about scholarly communication, what we usually mean is um, the communication of scientific content or, or findings within academic spheres. So um, usually in scholarly communication, it's researchers that speak to other researchers, for example, through journal articles or um, conference presentations and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, this uh, kind of communication could also be called in-reach or internal science communication, therefore, sometimes, as opposed to external science communication. And that's what the focus of this session is on. With external science communication or just science communication, um, what we usually mean is um, the communication of scientific content that is not primarily aimed at academic um, audiences but for example, at the lay public as a major target group. And um, in addition to um, these non-academic audiences, also um, other actors from outside of science might be involved in science communication. For example, you could think of um, PR officers of research institutes, for instance, who might um, select certain publications from the institute to be highlighted in press releases or um, science journalists who also work in um, transforming scientific publications into new formats and new um, outputs that might be more easily digestible for um, the audiences. Yeah, um, nevertheless, um, 
it should of course be noted that these are not two completely distinct um, systems that are divided from each other, but that there is considerable overlap between scholarly communication and science communication. And I think one can say that especially um, over the past two decades, with the developments in regard to social media and also digital media and um, also um, increased commitments to open science overall, that um, this distinction between scholarly and science communication um, was further blurred, this line between these two systems. Um, an example for that would be um, yeah, the multitude of, of social media and online channels that many researchers nowadays use to disseminate um, parts of their work and their research in varying formats and varying sizes. Um, and there, of course, often it's virtually impossible to tell whether the audience right now is primarily an academic one or primarily um, a non-academic one. Okay, um, from, from the scientometric point of view, uh, one question in relation to science uh, communication might often be of particular interest. And it's also a question that will be um, taken up again and again in this session. And that is, um, how does visibility generated by various modes of science communication affect the impact of research products? And I would argue that if we look at previous research on uh, factors affecting the impact of research products, um, more work has been done with regards to aspects related to scholarly communication. I think one um, way to show this is to look at the literature review done by Tahamtan et al. in 2016, where the authors um, examined the current literature on um, factors affecting citations as one prototypical measurement of uh, research impact. And um, of the 28 um, factors that they identified, um, they then um, grouped these into three um, groups, three categories. And those were paper-related, author-related, and journal-related factors. And I think this shows that quite a lot has been done uh, in the past on questions like, how does um, the decision in which journal to publish affect my expected citation counts? Or how does the decision about um, the precise publication format within a journal affect um, expected citation counts and so on? Um, and I would argue that a bit less has been done regarding a questions um, related to external science communication and how factors uh, regarding external science communication affect um, impact metrics. Um, which is one of the reasons why we um, proposed this session. Um, nevertheless, there has, of course, been a past work. And just to summarize, a few uh, findings um, that have been made is that um, several case studies have, for example, shown a positive association between research articles being covered in newspapers and their later citation rates. Uh, similarly, case studies have found that if um, research articles um, are promoted in press releases, then this can be associated with higher usage metrics in the form of web hits or PDF downloads and also higher citations. And um, in the aforementioned um, Medico project, we also did um, similar uh, types of treatment control studies where we also found um, articles being promoted in press releases or in embargo emails which are emails from scholarly publishers to science journalists to alert these of particularly um, interesting new publications, um, that these kinds of mentions are also associated with significant advantages regarding citations at many types of alt metrics for the promoted research articles as compared to similar um, articles that did not receive this kind of mention. Yeah, now, um, before I hand over to our first invited speaker of today, I want to close this short introduction to the theme by um, highlighting one particular challenge that a lot of these um, these case studies that I just summarized very briefly for you, um, that all of these face. And um, that is that it always remains extremely difficult to translate these correlations that we can observe into causalities or to explain them with causalities. Um, I think Phillips et al. in their now uh, 30 year old paper um, uh, summarize this very well um, with two hypotheses that they suggest that might be um, helpful in explaining the positive associations that we can see between research articles getting promoted in external science communication like newspapers and their later expected metrics. 
And um, the first of these hypotheses would be the publicity hypothesis, which basically states that um, because an article appears in the newspaper, for example, um, this increases its uh, visibility, therefore also its likelihood to be seen by other researchers, and therefore also its likelihood to be cited by other researchers. While on the other hand, the um, earmark hypothesis um, would state that when uh, journalists or PR officers choose research articles um, for their stories, to cover them in the stories or to um, promote them in press releases, then they might actually apply very similar criteria to what researchers apply when they decide on which literature to cite in their own work. For example, these different decisions might all be based on factors like scientific quality, of course, on, or rigor, or newsworthiness. And therefore, according to the Ermac hypothesis, these different groups would, independently from each other, just arrive at very similar conclusions at which papers are actually noteworthy and therefore deserve to be featured in press releases, in newspaper articles, but also to be cited in other research articles. Okay. Um, yeah, so much for our short introduction to the theme. I now want to hand over to our first speaker of the day, who is um, Markus Lehmkuhl. And um, Markus Lehmkuhl is Professor of Science Communication in Digital Media at the KIT Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Karlsruhe in Germany. Um, and uh, next to a scientific work, which primarily revolves around topics of science journalism and representations of science and mass media. Professor Lehmkuhl also worked as a freelance journalist for various outlets and is editor-in-chief for the online magazine Meta on Journalism and Science. And uh, today, Professor Lehmkuhl will present insights from his ongoing research project Media Neuro, which examines interactions between mass media and research, taking neuroscience as its exemplary case. And with that, I hand over to you, Markus, and please start whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you for the kind invitation uh, to the opportunity to present the work of uh, our research group. Uh, the members of the research groups are written on the first slide. And this is work uh, that is uh, funded by the National Science Foundation in Germany, DFG, and uh, the RNR, the French national founder of uh, research. And this is a joint project and I mean the, the grant in itself promotes cooperation between French and German scientists and to the one hand and on the other it uh, promotes <clears throat> interdisciplinary work interdisciplinary work uh, we as the social scientists uh, and uh, our colleagues in France uh, represent the neuro neuroscience uh, side of the project. Well, uh, let me begin my presentation by very briefly outlining the theoretical perspective I have as a journalism researcher on the topic of this panel. I mean, in journalism research, when we talk about the relationship between public communication and research impact, we are generally talking about a coordination mechanism between the selections of journalism and science. And a somewhat abbreviated an orientation of science to the selections of journalism is predominantly seen as problematic or even highly problematic. An orientation of journalism to the selections of science, on the other hand, is seen as desirable in principle. But this uh, works also the other way around. That's why I grouped the small traffic signs under the big ones. Um, some see orientation of science to public communication as a kind of democratization and the orientation of journalism to science as danger for its independency. Well, in my discipline, this coordination is studied under the term medialization of science. This is a concept coined by the German sociologist Peter Weingart in the 90s, I think. And this concept assumes two things. First, that journalism in, journalism's interest in, in science has increased. And secondly, that this increase in the public importance of science has repercussions on it. And especially the repercussions of this supposed public upgrade 
on science are the focus of interest of this branch of research. Well, the aim of our working group in recent years has been to contribute to an empirical upgrade of this concept, which uh, up to now has primarily been plausibilized through individual case studies. And uh, in the following, I will present key findings of eight studies of our research group. Two of them are still preprints and under review, and one is not completely finished. Well, these studies are interrelated and are intended to contribute to clarifying the question, at least a bit, the question on how plausible fears or hopes of repercussions of media selectivity on science or on individual areas of science are. And um, of course, to manage that in this time frame, I will omit, of course, detailed information about method and, and things like that. I hope you are fine with that. So, uh, first of all, I would like to start with the structure and the extent of science coverage in the media. Um, after all, the repercussions of media selections on scientific selections presuppose that a significant public is created for scientific events in general and for scientific studies in particular. So far, we have investigated this question with three studies of different kinds. Well, in a first study based on a sample of German media titles, we examined how often one and the same scientific event, for instance, a single finding, was picked up by several titles at the same time. The so-called congruence of the selection is used here as an indicator of the ability of journalism to focus public attention on individual scientific findings or other scientific events. Well, I would like to summarize the findings of this studies in the follow in the, of this study in the following way. Well, the vast majority of scientific events, namely a good 92% are exclusively covered by only one German media title. This is this dot and this is 92% has been covered by just one media title. Um, the fact that a scientific event is covered congruently by all or only a good share of more than 50% of the media titles and those receives a great deal of publicity does not happen in a normal week. The fact that public attention is focused on a scientific event and those provokes follow-up communication is to be considered a relatively rare exception. This means that science journalism is to a much lesser extent than journalism on politics, for example, able to focus public attention on individual events. However, this is a basic condition for an event to be widely disseminated. Well, in two further studies, we have tried to estimate how rarely scientific results trigger a noteworthy resonance in national media markets. And we have those attempted to estimate roughly the number of study results that have met with the noteworthy response in journalism. And that is, we have tried to estimate how many studies belong to the group of events that are marked red here. Uh, that means that have found a comparatively larger distribution. Well, the analysis is based on the evaluation of the MSM altmetric scores of all approximately 8 million study findings that are listed in Scopus for the period between 2014 and 2018. The study results highlighted in the, in the dark gray box are those that achieved an MSM score bigger than 100. Only with this relatively high score 
we can conclude with some certainty that the study result has met with a noteworthy response in one or more of three media markets, UK, Germany, USA. Well, we have investigated this in corresponding validations. So, well, according to this finding, a study by Jambeck et al. in uh, 2015 uh, on plastic waste inputs into the ocean has reached the highest dissemination. It has been the most covered finding and belongs to a group of approximately 1,000 other studies that has received great attention in journalism in this time, uh, time period. Well, if one takes this analysis as a yardstick, then one or two results among 10,000 achieve a notable resonance on one or more national media markets, whereby, of course, there are great differences between the disciplines and areas. Well, the distribution of these areas is in line with numerous studies, studies that have investigated this. For instance, medicine, of course, represents the largest share of these papers we call social impact papers, SIP. Well, medicine is followed by neuroscience and biology, archaeology plays also a role and so on. Well, if we return to the initial question, then based on these findings, we can first state that coordination between public presence and research is not plausible in the vast majority of scientific fields because they hardly ever produce multi-system relevant events. So in the second step, we turned to the relationship between media selectivity and the selectivity of scientific journals. Well, we wanted to know whether the number of thematically similar studies increases after a study has met with significant resonance in the mass media. And the answer is yes. After a paper has gained significant publicity, more thematically similar papers appear in two years afterwards than in the two years before. This is indicated here in this figure um, by a median above the zero line. This applies both to the case where a popular result has appeared in a highly prestigious journal from a point of view of journalists, these are Science, Nature, PNNS, JAMA, Lancet, and to the case where it has not appeared in a top journal. This means that the effect also occurs when not so widely quoted journals have published, a show, uh, have published a social impact paper. In addition to this analysis, we have only investigated publications in the journals Nature and Science, which are of course very clearly favored by journalists to see. And we did this to see whether this correspondence also occurs when we compare studies published there without significant media resonance with those that have achieved great resonance in journalism? And the answer is again, yes. The number of similar articles rise only if a finding published by nature or science has been broadly covered. If not, the number of similar articles decreases. Well, in parallel, uh, we have taken up the question of whether there is a connection between the media resonance of study results and their citation rate. The answer is yes again. Well, taken together very briefly, we are able to show that media, media publicity corresponds to higher citation rates, which uh, enable them which, well, this of course, uh, Stefan has shown that with this final, we can reproduce all the study findings. Um, oh, this is the wrong slide. This is the slide I wanted to show, and this is the next slide. And um, we uh, have also investigated, that is my point here, we have also investigated the relationship between the extent of reporting and the citation rate. 
As can be seen, the difference in the citation rates of biomedical studies is greater the more news reports have appeared about a study. However, this increase is not significant different, different in the last category, which includes findings that have been covered very extensively compared to the one before. I mean, this category. Um, however, it seems that congruency of media uptake is all in all positively associated with a larger number of citations. Well, I uh, started off this brief overview of um, our findings with the relationship between research and selections in journalism, which uh, is also how I would like to conclude the presentation. In two further studies, we have investigated whether there is a positive relationship between the reputation of scientists and their uh, selection by journalists as scientific experts. And so far we have investigated this relationship in eight issues and I have brought with me the findings relating to the coverage of COVID-19 in German quality newspapers and to the coverage of swine and bird flu which made headlines worldwide in, the, in 2009 and 2003 respectively. In relation to COVID-19 the answer is yes. The publicly visible scientists have a higher reputation than the comparison sample, measured by their bi bibliometric profiles. This applies to four indicators, the number of publications, the age index, the number of thematically relevant studies, and the age index related to these studies. Well, who is the reference group? Who is the comparison group? It is a random sample of contributing experts who work or have worked at German research institutions and have published thematically relevant publications in the period between 1999 and 2020. This is why we call them in line with Collins contributing experts. This is the reference group. Well, as mentioned, we did the same for seven other bi biomedical issues. Uh, I brought with the findings that relate to earlier pandemic debates with me. And again, the comparison suggests that the visible had a higher reputation, but uh, these differences are only significant in, um, I don't know if I am still online. You are, we can still hear you. Uh, you can still hear me. Okay, I'm not, I was not sure about that. So uh, where I was here, uh, when uh, we compare this finding regarding COVID-19 with, um, with press coverage on further, on previous uh, pandemics. And you see again, the comparison suggests that the visible scientists had a higher reputation, but uh, this is limited to uh, two of four categories. So this possibly, this possibly suggests that the bias in favor of scientists with high reputations is more pronounced in COVID-19 than in previous debates on pandemics, which could be a consequence of the unprecedented public importance of the COVID-19 debate. Well, this is also suggestion by a second comparison. Here we compared the average citation rates of relevant articles of the, of the visible scientists with the average citation rate of all relevant papers uh, published between a certain time frame. Well, and regarding COVID-19, papers on virology and epidemiology of infectious diseases has been cited on average approximately 28 times. This is the, the, the yellow line here in this graph. And the papers of the visible scientists have been cited a bit more than 40 times on average. And in the case of previous pandemics, there is also a difference, but not as big as in the case of COVID-19. Well, let me conclude by briefly discussing what we can deduce about the concept of medialization from these studies from my point of view. 
First of all, we can state that we have evidence for a certain correspondence between the selections of journalism and those of research. However, this remains limited to a very small part of the research. I would call it a tiny fraction. This does not say much about how widespread an orientation towards media logics is within research. Such an orientation can also be influenced by something other than actual media coverage. For example, by funding organizations making popularization a selection criterion or things like that. What can be said, however, with regard to the enormous selectivity of journalism is that if um, that if this orientation has become widespread, for example, through funding policy, then it is not very effective. Well, what can be said with regard to the reper repercussions of journalistic selectivity on research? Well, we and others find quite robust correlations at relatively high levels of aggregation but we cannot yet convincingly interpret them as an impact of media selectivity on research because we lack insights at the micro level. Well, we don't know, uh, for example, how concretely a media orientation is supposed to manifest itself in the selection actions of an editor in a scientific journal like Nature or Science or something, or PNAS, whatever. However what, our finding, however, what our findings suggest so far is that the public dissemination of study results in the very rare cases where it takes place has an impact on the selection process and research. But what they do not suggest, in my view, is some kind of systemic threat to the research system through real life media selectivity, selectivity as some suggest or to reformulate this from a completely different perspective. Now I come back to what I've said at the very beginning. We don't see anything that could be substantiated with the term democratization of research. Moreover, this is my last point. With regard to professional science journalism, we actually see nothing in our data that could justify a consistently negative assessment of its selection routines. Sure, each of us has read about studies in the newspapers that say that chocolate makes you slim or that uh, vaccination promote autism and the like. However, based on, on our findings, these individual cases are not suitable to illustrate a typical or even general pattern of selection routines in journalism. On the contrary, the selection routines in journalism seem to be oriented towards criteria that also apply in the academic system. Again, turned differently, we do not see journalism selecting completely independently of research selection criteria. So at the very end, I will risk a take home message. Well, and this is like this. Yes, there are probably repercussions on the mass media and research, but don't worry too much about it. There are several other things in research, research that should wor worry us more, and that has not so much to do with what mass media actually do. One concern worth mentioning is the extent to which scientists, publishers, and more importantly, funders believe in the need for publicity, which can be measured, for instance, by the number of press re releases we, with which the communication system is flooded. So that was my last sentence. Thank you uh, for your attention. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for a highly interesting uh, talk. Um, we have a little bit of time left for maybe one question and we have one question uh, from the audience. I'll just read it out to you. Um, it says, uh, thank you for a great presentation. Sure. STI community unity deals with the development and use of research assessment methods and indicators. Learn from your findings. When I got the question right, this question is about uh, possible indicators. Uh, uh, 
Well, I have an indicator in mind, but this is quite, I, I, I'm, fear, I'm afraid that it is quite complex to explain, but I will try to do it uh, in a minute. Well, we think that if you look for, um, for indicators that may, that, may, um, that may tell us some things about the societal, dissemin uh, societal dissemination of a thing, we need to look for uh, the, the, the exponent of the distributions, the distribution usually are the distribution are usually in the form of a power law distribution, and these power law distributions have an exponent, and this exponent may be useful as in highly aggregated indicator for assessing the societal dissemination of uh, uh, of, of of let's say of research findings in general. For instance, this indicator can be used um, can be used to describe uh, in a in a in a long time period the development of a societal dissemination of scientific findings. That would be one answer. I don't know if you got the answer. I'm not sure if I got it by myself. But this is our idea about indica indic indicators that comes out of our research. Thank you. I think that was a very precise answer in my eyes. Um, I think now uh, we should go on to the second presentation. But um, as I mentioned in the beginning um, to the audience, in case you've got any um, further questions for Professor Lehmkuhl, um, you of course still can submit them. And if we have time in the end, we might come back to them, just so you know. But for now, um, thank you very much again, uh, Markus Lehmkuhl, for your presentation. And uh, let's uh, hand over to our second speaker of the session, uh, Professor Odunia Malea. Um, Enrico Odunia Malea is tenured associate professor of information sciences in the Department of Audiovisual Communication, Documentation and History of Art at the Technical University of Valencia in Spain. And um, his main research interests revolve around informatic studies of the web and more specifically, the design of evaluation models to measure academic, social and business environments. And um, today, Professor Odunia Malea will pre present recent research on Eureka Alert and reflections on how centrometric inspired approaches could be used to study science communication. And um, with that, I hand over to you. So please start when you are ready. Hey, thanks so much for your kind introduction and for your kind invitation to be here uh, with you all. I'm very happy uh, to present in this, uh, this work in progress with uh, Rodrigo Costas. Uh, my, pre my presentation will be focused on the analysis of press releases as object, okay, as an, online, as an online object I can use to measure some aspects of science communication. And we are using Jury Colors platform as a, as a database of press releases. Okay, so as a brief agenda for my presentation, I will start with some aspects, differentiation uh, on the one hand, the scholarly communication and on the other, the science communication. Then I will uh, talk about proselysis as an object I can use to measure some aspects of the interactions in the science communication. I will explain it later. Then I will move to the main goals of this uh, work in progress. I will show you the method we are using to gather all the data. I will share you with some preliminary findings that we have achieved. And I will end my presentation with uh, four discussion polls that we are discussing ourselves in the development of this work. OK, so I will start with the scholarly communication. This is like a framework we can um, identify diverse dimensions in the scholarly communication. The scholarly communication, I mean, all these things are happening inside the scientific process. We can identify objects, for example, a paper, we can identify actors, and in some interactions. Interactions between actors, between objects, and even interactions between an actor and an object. And we can use analytical frameworks from bibliometrics to analyze all these things. Okay, so we are doing an analogy with this same framework, but moving to the science communication. That is, these things are happening 
outside the scientific process. So we can still identify actors, identify an objects, for example, the approach release, and other kind of interactions, okay? And again, we can see interactions between actors, objects, and between objects and actors. So this work in progress is focused on press releases that we are getting from the Jury Alerts platform. Okay, so let me show uh, a model of scholarly communication, a very simplified model, so sorry for the simplification. In the upside of my slide, we have the creation process. Some tickets ago, we had only the publication, publishing in formal channels, journals, books, uh, book chapters, proceedings, whatever. Now we have other places, for example, repositories to upload preliminary findings, preprints. Um, we have other places to upload data, to upload code, and other preliminary findings related with the research we are carrying out. And in the bottom side of my slide, we have a dissemination stage. First, we have an indexation process. Uh, obviously, all these research results uh, are indexed in some places. Uh, the uh, formal publication, in, obviously, in formal bibliographical uh, databases, but not only bibliographical databases. We have other search engines, for example, Google or Google Scholar, to, the same, to index all that kind of material. Once these research results are indexed, we can disseminate uh, these results using the traditional or the new media. And finally, once it's disseminated, we can monitor, we can use specific analytical frameworks to analyze the impact or echo that these research results achieved. We can highlight a redissemination loop in this process, and this is the place where we are putting the press releases. This brief statement, these manuscripts, can talk about one or more publications in a flat or plain uh, words, talking or promoting this, these publications, and uh, we consider this, this press release as an independent object that, that can be re-indexed in, in search engines in, and in other uh, databases, re-disseminated, and we can get some specific new metrics that we can measure at the end. So this is more or less our idea. So obviously, press releases can be used for different things. I will not extend in, in this slide, but obviously, uh, I use uh, one of the reasons to use is uh, to promote uh, some publications. That is some kind of science communication. Mm -hmm. So in this way for us press releases constitute a very interesting object to analyze uh, within a, a metric pers uh, perspective this press release can include interviews with the authors or with other experts providing some uh, comments about the general findings of the article being promoted can include specific tables or figures specifically uh, uh, built to be included in the press release uh, YouTube uh, videos, for example, commentaries, related readings, a lot of um, complementary aspects. And moreover, it includes a URL. So uh, I can measure the number of documents including a URL to a press release. So I can measure a lot of things considering a press release as an object. With this in mind, we are using Jury Colored as a database because uh, this is global uh, with a, um, a lot of uh, press releases published uh, every year. We will see some figures later. And this is an example of uh, a press release published in the Jury Gallet platform. We can see a title, we can see a URL, okay, identifying this, this press release, and we can, we can identify a specific metadata, for example, an author. We have a journalist from one specific institution. We have an explicit relationship with the uh, article being promoted. For example, this is uh, a journal, specifically a journal being promoted. Uh, we have a connection with social media so that I can measure the number of mentions to this press release. So we can build like an, 
analytical framework to analyze the impact of this press release specifically. So this is the engine of our work in progress. So that we want to analyze press releases as a, an online object that can be used to measure some aspects of science communication and obviously to identify and uh, describe some press releases level metrics. That is one of the purposes of this work. Okay, so to do this, uh, we developed this method, gathering data from three uh, different places. First, uh, gathering all press releases published in Jure Alert. This is more than 400,000 press releases from the beginning of uh, Jure Alert to February uh, 2021 and extracting a specific metadata and all digital objects identifiers embedded in each press release. Then we moved to Twitter. In Twitter, we gathered every tweet from the beginning of, of Twitter, including a hyperlink uh, to one jury colored press release. Okay? And uh, finally, we extracted the specific metadata from each tweet. And uh, finally, we moved to Majestic. Majestic is uh, an intelligent uh, link tool. And uh, this, this platform allows us to analyze and to measure the number of links to one specific website. And in this case, we are analyzing the number of websites that include at least one hyperlink to a jury alert process. So we gathered all this information, this million web pages including a hyperlink to a press release to build an analytical framework to analyze press releases level metrics. Okay, so I will share you some first some uh, descriptive results uh, about uh, Jure Carlos press releases. We have detected an, an increase over the years uh, of press releases published. In 2020, more than 30,000 press releases published. This is a huge number, so press release, you recall it is a huge database of press releases, so that is important for us with incredible numbers, in, in my opinion. And we can use this to analyze specific uh, topics, okay, about science. This is the keywords included in the metadata of each press release. These findings are similar uh, to those obtained by Timo. Timothy Bowman in a, in a previous paper that was very useful for us, very interesting. We can see that jury colored is covering mainly medicine and health related uh, disciplines and biology. We can see in this map uh, from Voss viewer, I see that is like science under the lens or under the eyes of, of jury colors. And we can see, for example, in this green cluster, the importance of medicine and health related disciplines in the coverage of uh, jury colored processes. That is, the articles being promoted and disseminated in the jury colored platform. And we can see, in fact, all the fields of knowledge and the connections between them. Okay, so uh, this is in general, but we can use these process releases to analyze more specific aspects about the science uh, communication. For example, a specific topics uh, like COVID-19, we can analyze, for example, the number of press releases, including in the description of the press release, the term COVID-19 or coronavirus. And we can see, for example, an increase of the number of press releases from 2020 onwards. So we can use uh, these press releases from Yuri Color to analyze specific topics of importance in a specific time. Then uh, we move to the analysis of a specific aggregates, in this case uh, of journals, and uh, we use two methods to analyze uh, the journals. In this first case, uh, we analyze the metadata included in each HTML of each press uh, release in the jury alert. And we can see, uh, okay, general uh, multidisciplinary journals, science, nature, PNAs, obviously, and some mega journals, for example, nature communications and plus one. 
we have the number of press releases published um, mentioning the metadata of each press release. Uh, we also calculated the coverage of, uh, of your regards. I mean, in, in the second column, we have the total publications in each journal with a digital object identifier uh, gathered from Scopus database. And we have the percentage of these DOIs covered in your regard press releases. And we can see specific results that for me and in my opinion are very interesting. For example, PLOS Medicine. Almost 50% of all publications in PLOS Medicine have been mentioned in the metadata of a jury product process. So that is very interesting to see the biases and the coverage of jury card as a database. Okay, the second method was using the digital objects identifiers embedded in the HTML of each press list. So this list is slightly different from the previous one. One press list can include a hyperlink to uh, one specific paper, but necessarily not is the paper being promoted in that press release, can be a related reading. So we calculated the number of toys for each uh, journal, in this case, Nature Communications is the, the journal with uh, the higher number of DOIs. And we have included some, uh, some metrics in average values, the citations from uh, Scopus and some other metrics that we gathered from uh, Blamix. We can see as uh, some specific journals are highlighting in a specific metrics, but nature and science are highlighting almost in every in every metric except nature in in the number of tutors. Okay, in the number of tweets including a uh, okay, I mentioned. So um, seeing this uh, specific uh, performance of nature and science, we develop it and a specific treatment control analysis. So to check this, this performance of these two journals, we gathered all publications uh, published in 2017. We extracted uh, the digital object identifier of each publication, and we checked whether this DOI appeared in a URIC alert press release, okay? And we calculated a specific statistics for each journal. We have the mean, the median, and the, per the 19 percentile. We can see that for these specific publications covered in Eureka Alert press releases, those articles uh, covered exhibit a higher performance for nature and for science. This is not to, uh, uh, to, to conclude anything about the publicity hypothesis or the earmark hypothesis, but we are seeing that this, these publications have a higher impact, okay, with these metrics covered. And moving uh, to Twitter, we are developing a specific press releases level metrics. In this case, we can see the number of tweets, including at least one hyperlink to a jury card press release. And we are normalizing this, this data according to the number of press releases published each year. I mean, we can see in, in the yellow line as the number of tweets per press release is declining over the years. This is because the number of press releases is increasing a lot in the last few years and the number of tweets is, is declining. Okay, The number of tweets including a hyperlink to a press release is slightly declining, so probably we can see that Twitter is declining as a dissemination channel of Eurocolored press releases. Playing with, with these press releases level metrics, we built this correlation matrix uh, using experiment correlation only with uh, the, press the, the press releases achieving uh, one hyperlink from one web page and so that we have for each press release 
the number of uh, web pages, the number of linking web domains, the number of tweets, the number of likes, retweets, and so on. And uh, we calculated these correlations. Well, some of these correlations are statistically significant with a moderate correlation are lower than expected. And this is probably because specifically in Twitter, we are finding that some press releases are achieve uh, a high engagement because of the specific actions of a specific users in one moment in time. And this action is not a shift in, in, in the web at a large, okay, in, in the links to this um, press release. Okay, so just to finalize my, my presentation, some uh, troubles, some discussions that we are facing in the development of this work. We find that press release is, is a very interesting object to measure and unexplored to analyze uh, from the point of view of the creation of new metrics. We can use it to measure some aspects of science communication, but we need to take into account some uh, specific concerns because press release is a very particular document. The authorship is different, he's a journalist. The institution that is uh, submitting the press release can be different, can be a journal, can be a university. So that makes press releases a different object to take into account. And we need to identify and uh, to understand these press releases matters, what they are showing us. And uh, just finalizing, obviously, press releases as a model can change. And Juric Alert in particular, as a platform, some uh, experts are criticizing the Juric Alert model, the Juric Alert model. Probably a decade ago was very good, but today with other tools, probably uh, this, this model can change. We have, for example, the conversation, the platform, the conversation that provides uh, a different direction from press releases, press releases written by directly by the authors instead uh, the journalists. So we need to, to be aware about the changes in, the, in, in this world of press releases. And this is the end. Thanks for your attention. And I will, I will be happy to respond in any, any question. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you very much for another very interesting um, presentation. We have a few minutes left for questions. Um, I can't see any uh, question from the audience right now. I'd just uh, use the chance, therefore, to start with a question from myself. <laughs> um, although it might be a rather trivial one, it um, concerns your slide 17. And um, I ask myself, what exactly does the highlighting mean? What was the condition for that? Could you elaborate on that, please, exactly? If this, um, to highlight the, the level of, of, each, of each journal, you mean? In, yeah, the, the darker spaces, sorry. OK, in, in this case, this is average values, first thing because uh, the median values for, for this table was uh, not the best option because we achieve a very, um, a very skewed distribution. So the median was almost zero for a lot of, a lot of indicators, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, just I checked some of the specific values because, because we uh, were specifically higher than the rest. This is not a specific threshold in this case, but we can see that we have a specific values higher than others. Um, but the problem here is really is the understanding of the number of DOIs per press release. So I, I will focus here because this is the number of DOIs appearing in each press release, okay? So we, we found in our database press releases promoting more than 20 papers, okay? In other cases, we, we found press releases promoting one press release, but with 10 related readings, and with the digital object identifier included as a hyperlink in the press release. All these links are counted here. So um, more than 
analyzing these highlighting values, our problem is to understand the meaning of this number of joys appearing in the press releases. Okay, and the difference of this number with the previous one. Because this is something that the journalists are including in the metadata. This is information from the journalist, and we check it that sometimes it's wrong. Okay. So probably the focus is the understanding of counting this number of, of joys. And obviously this information can, can change with other databases, but uh, our understanding is that some journals are getting more benefits from appearing in the press releases in this case. I don't know if I correctly answered your, your question. I think so, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, unfortunately, we have to wrap up now. Uh, uh, our time's over. Um, there was one more question from the audience also. I will forward that to you um, after today's session. Um, so, um, yeah, all that's left is that I want to thank again our two invited speakers for their thought-provoking provo and highly interesting presentations they gave to us. And, of course, uh, the audience for staying with us. And, um, yeah, now I wish you a nice break and hopefully a nice uh, last few uh, sessions here at STI. So, bye. Thank you so much. Bye.